Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session. My name is Tamara Amin from KFAS, and I will be your moderator this evening. Thank you for taking the time aside to join us this evening. I know that there are lots of things fighting for your attention, so we're very happy to have everyone. Tonight's session will be focusing on the role of and contributions of the Kuwait's research and scientific community in responding to the novel coronavirus pandemic, in particular highlighting the role of the health sector. This event, uh, as I'm sure you know, is part of KFAS's ongoing webinar series, and a recorded version of the webinar will be made available if you would like to share it or refer back to it. We will be starting this evening with opening statements from Dr. Salim al Hajra from KFAS, who will provide background information on the KFAS Emergency Resilient Program and the special call for research proposal that was launched uh, in order to address the impact of COVID-19 on priority sectors in Kuwait. This will be followed by presentations by four members of our local scientific community on the excellent research that they have conducted as part of the, of the ERP special call. And we will end the evening with a 15-minute Q&A. So feel free to discuss and interact uh, and submit your questions in the chat. And if you would like a specific speaker to answer your question, you can indicate that in your question. And we will do our best to try to address them all at the end of the session during the Q&A. OK, so that was our agenda for tonight. Uh, let's begin. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Salim al the Deputy, Direct Deputy Director General of the Strategic Thrust Program here at KFAS. Before joining KFAS, Dr. Al-Hajjab held the position of Executive Director for the Energy and Building Research Center at KISER. He is also a Founder and Director for the uh, El Shagaya Renewable Energy Initiative and has 25 years of experience in various scientific and research fields. So I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Salim. Thank you, Tamara. Dr. Salim. For the introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our uh, uh, respected uh, speakers and also our uh, uh, guests uh, who are joining us at this uh, late time of the day. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all at this uh, webinar on the role of uh, Kuwait research and scientific community in responding to the coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, which is dedicated uh, tonight uh, for the health sector. KFAS is uh, in, in its role as a catalyst for science and technology in Kuwait, is committed to supporting the national effort to transform the country from the entire state to knowledge-driven economy, as well as serving the national goals envisioned in the new Kuwait 2035 vision and strategic plan, in addition to the national five years development plan of Kuwait. KFAS invested in research and human capital development, deployment of pilot scale demonstration projects, and initiatives that provide innovative solutions to challenges in the national priority areas such as environment, health, energy, water, and other areas. If 2020 has shed some insight into any aspect of our lives, whether personally or professionally, is that to address and mitigate a global public health emergency dependence on science and technology and research findings. The pandemic emphasized the importance and the need for scientific research and development using technologies of the 21st century, modern medicine, and evidence-based policymakers. Therefore, in response to the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, KFAS launched the Emergency Resilience Program back in March 2020 with the goal of supporting the national effort in mitigating the impact of pandemic on a number of sectors such as health, education, business resilience and uh, NGOs, as well as to promote the readiness of civil society, public awareness through information technology to reduce the spread of the virus and mitigate its impact on the society. As part of the emergency resilience program, KFAS also launched a special call for proposals 
research proposals targeting the research and scientific community in Kuwait. Uh, the goal is that through the findings provided, a better understanding will be gained not only into the uh, epidemiology and morphology of the virus or potential therapies, but also into the economic implications of the disease, as well as how to ensure the continuity of sectors vital to the development of the society, such as health and education during the outbreak of the pandemic. The response to this special call by researchers from academic and research institutions within Kuwait, as well as the Ministry of Health and the private sector was overwhelming and we very much appreciate their enthusiasm and dedication to take the time and submit their ideas and proposals to, to campus. Ladies and gentlemen, the aim of this webinar is to highlight the role and contribution made by the research and scientific community to the national response to the pandemic, especially in the health sector, and the support provided by CAFAS through its COVID-19 special cycle, which offered funding for a large number of research projects and studies in different disciplines and sectors. Let me share with you some of the highlights of the special call uh, we launched last uh, March. The number of research grant applications received during this cycle, which spanned for about one month only, 168 proposals were received uh, to CAFAS. 108, about 46 person grant application are in the health sector only the remaining either in business or in education. The approved budget for the health projects only to date is around 1 million Kuwaiti dinar. 53 applications were received from Kuwait University, 23 uh, application or proposal received from KISER, Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, 18 proposal from Ministry of Health, 26 proposals from the private sector, 10, pro uh, 10 proposals from the Sman Diabetic Institute, DDI, 12 proposals from uh, PAIT, and four uh, proposals from private uh, university, Kuwait College for Science and Technology. KFAS shall continue to act as a major agent of change that support and engage with future sustainability leaders, scientists, researchers, and academics, and the youth to accelerate development changes that have a global impact. Tonight, we have selected some of the pioneer researchers who made a change and made a difference through their dedicated lab work and research, and that uh, gain from the KFAS funding cycle, special cycle, to share with us some of their findings and results, and probably, probably get the chance to have a chat with them, Q&A with them, to enlighten the way forward. Finally, I would like to extend my gratitude and thanks to our distinguished speakers, as well as our guests. Wish you all successful and fruitful webinar tonight and look forward to see you in different and future events. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salem, for that introduction. As a member of the research director here at KFAS, I know just how much uh, the scientific community has been dedicating their time uh, during this pandemic. And with that said, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Professor Fahed El Mullah. Uh, he is the Chief Scientific Officer at Desmond Diabetes Institute and heads the Department of Genetics and Bioinformatics. He also serves as a Professor of Molecular Pathology and Genomic Medicine at Kuwait University. Professor Al Mulla has extensive experience in genomic related technologies and intellectual property development. 
He serves as chair of the evidence group in the Global Genomic Medicine Collaboration. And tonight, his talk is titled Beyond Genetic Sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. Welcome, Professor al -Mulla. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Because they are mute all their mics. You oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, look, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Let me just expand my uh, presentation and remove the subtitles. Uh, my name is Fahad Al-Mullah. I'm a professor of genomic medicine at Kuwait University. I'm also the chief scientific officer at the Desman Diabetes Institute. And today we'll talk to you about uh, a subject, uh, the title is called Beyond Genetic Sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. You all know beautiful Kuwait, um, 4 million to 200,000 uh, people uh, live in this beautiful city. Um, and really, I want to tell you something about the uh, epidemiology, a little um, a consequence of the of, of pandemics. I mean, why, why do pandemics happen? And um, what determines the outcome of, of a pandemic? Well, really, what determines the outcome of the pandemic is uh, depends uh, largely on, on on the pathogen itself, uh, whether it's it's very pathogenic or not, and also depends on the host host susceptibility. What changes? What genetic changes uh, happens in 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 the host itself that this pathogen is infecting? Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, attention goes to the uh, um, environmental and governmental action, which uh, is really at the moment the responsibility of the Ministry of Health. Um, so we will focus on the pathogen and, and the host uh, susceptibility. Um, so. Uh, really, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 has about 30,000 nucleotides. Uh, it's a single-stranded positive RNA, and it has 9,860 amino acids. These are the, the genes that it's made up of, uh, of, and these genes really has roles in assembling uh, this variant. Uh, and it's called the corona because of the crown uh, appearance, because of this S protein, the spike protein. And muta mutations really happens everywhere. And the mutation rate of this virus is about, um, you know, um, 24 uh, every year. So it's not high because it has a repair capability uh, and mechanism. So I will talk a little bit about how this pathogen is uh, influencing us and, and why we were able to to do what we uh, what we supposed to do uh, with it. So. Uh, in, in any uh, epidemic, really, or any viruses, you trade off the fatality with the infectivity. So you hardly see very fatal viruses and very highly infecting viruses. Uh, you usually see a virus that is very highly infectious, but does not really cause mortality, and others that have high mortality, mortality or fatality but has very low or kind of average uh, infectivity. And the Spanish flu of 1918 and the coronavirus lie just in the middle. It's um, something that is peculiar and quite dangerous to have because you can kill about 3% of the people, uh, of the population you infect, and you're also uh, quite infectious. Uh, and so, uh, really, it is important to kind of sequence this virus and monitor it because it can go this way, which becomes more fatal or more infectious, 
or it can go this way and it becomes uh, not that deadly. Um, so um, on about 18th or uh, the 28th of January, we downloaded the Wuhan uh, sequence and the Chinese uh, put it there in the first to sequence the virus there. And I managed to align this virus and found these white areas there, align it with any other coronaviruses that, that we know. And there were kind of two, three areas that uh, did not align to any known coronaviruses. And these were very interesting areas. So I went to Dr. Kais and looking at the epidemiology of it, and I thought, uh, and Professor Hilal, and I thought, uh, I really have to warn you guys, uh, this is going to be a bad virus. And the really beauty about um, Dr. Kais and Professor Hilal is, is they listen. And they listen to scientists. And this is very important message I give to the um, policymakers. Uh, listen to the scientists. If you don't, uh, what happened in America will happen everywhere. That's why you have to listen to the scientists. So I was grateful to them that they listen. And, and basically, we started to uh, uh, look at ways to diagnose this virus. And uh, so this is, I uh, typed it in a Word document. These are all the A, G, C, T sequences uh, of, of this virus. And we chose some primers in these areas that do not have any homology to other viruses. And we really, this was a national emergency, so we had to act quickly. We're a diabetes center, but you know something? We wanted to help. Uh, we wanted to show that, uh, you know, uh, we were worried about. I was personally very, I'm still very worried about this virus. It's not the end game yet. And so, um, you know, the, it is a national emergency. And so uh, we really set up a category uh, two uh, biobank uh, area area of screening in the biobank and we could do about thousand to two thousand and we can increment it up to five thousand a day uh, of testing and we got the ministry of health who, who has been amazing uh, uh, really uh, you know managers and, and people who helped uh, ddi and we also reciprocated that help and so we we put a very uh, functional area to uh, to kind of uh, set up and diagnose the virus. And we trained people to do it properly uh, with no risk. Um, at the end of the day, uh, what you see here in purple are positive samples. So we developed uh, a really specific uh, DDI kit. And here we sequenced a little part of these fragments to just confirm this is COVID, SARS-CoV-2. And of course, we are now developing even much more sensitive um, um, kits that, that you can see can change the color uh, if you are infec infectious or not. And, and you can get the results of the antigen in 30 minutes. So we're working on this and we're dropping that down to even 10 minutes, which is, which is possible. At, at this time, I remind you, this is about early February. Um, the CDC had a kit which they had to withdraw. And so I uh, messaged or um, tweeted to Trump if he needs help with our kit, but he never answered. I know people would laugh at this point, but I like to uh, make, uh, make a point. So it is important now to sequence the virus. So this is what we did. Uh, and so um, we looked at the virus itself um, in, in Kuwait. So it looked like we had the Wuhan stra strain uh, in there. And we realized there was another strain shown here in yellow. This is the genome of the virus, and you can see spikes where there are common mutations. These are the numbers of diversity, the numbers, let's say, of people having this, um, this particular mutation. And you can see this mutation was becoming very common, uh, and this is the yellow one here. And no one, nobody really knew about uh, what to do with this, but we later turned out that all these green turned into yellow which is uh, part of this, uh, you know, uh, G strain uh, of the SARS-CoV-2, which became very, very infectious indeed. Um, this is a new strain that came up in uh, um, uh, recently, as you will see, 
and this uh, new mutation in the S protein called Y53 is only appearing a bit in uh, Holland and Denmark. Um, you never know if this will take over again, and this is why we have to be very, very careful with these viruses. They, they, they change, they mutate, and they take over. Uh, new, new mutations might add resistance to any, any vaccines uh, you do, and these vaccines will, will have to evolve equally. Um, the, the, uh, we, of course, submitted these sequences from, uh, from Kuwait, and, and we showed the people around the world what kind of strain we have and what kind of mutations we have. And, and you have to keep doing this, uh, uh, you know, very frequently. The mutation rate was 23 uh, mutations per year. Now it's about 24 and it's gonna increase uh, a little bit more. But this is just proof of concept that there is a GISAID, which is a database for all the influenza and the COVID and all the viruses you name. And now we imprinted our name of this man and the Ministry of Health into this database. And we were the first really Arab country uh, to submit this, followed immediately by Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar, later and, and uh, the Emirates, uh, Algiz Al Algeria as well has submitted there from the Arab world. Um, but we noted uh, to the world that uh, we were the first to tell them, listen, this mutation, the yellow I showed you, the D614 uh, of the S protein, we were the first to tell the world, be careful, this seems to be uh, really killing people more frequently than usual than the other and, and we received a very high citation for, for this work because we were the first to tell, to, to, to tell about it. And indeed, if you see almost all area were green and now almost all areas were, uh, are yellow. Um, and so the colors will change. And, and look at this uh, really scary thing. It's in, indeed what you see is the S protein here changes quite frequently. So it, it does change. And, and this, this is the, the peak of the uh, 614. Now we have, uh, um, I think, 477 here. It's a new one that, that, that came up as well. And so we were able to explain why this, um, you know, Dr. Anwar Mohammed was able to explain why this D614 <clears throat> was very aggressive and, and and it turns out that this mutation in the S protein of the virus um, binds more closely to the furin gene of the humans. So it's like the humans is allow, some humans allow uh, mutations to go into the, the virus to go into them if, they, if the virus is of that type. Uh, and so um, what is really, really innovative in what we have done is we classified, so not all SARS-CoV-2 is, is SARS-CoV-2. You've got a different, what we call clades. So we've got the G, the D, and these are the more highly, um, um, you know, associated with high fatality rates. The S is uh, another uh, strain. Uh, let's say of this virus and V and I is less and this is mainly found in the, in the Middle East uh, and this is probably one reason not other reason why is it not that uh, problem not as fatal as in in the UK or in the U in Europe and the US and of course you have the original uh, one but what is what is really uh, quite scary here is um, when we did haplotyping blocks on, on, on these uh, viruses, um, we, we realized that there is um, co-infections so that you've got different kind of strains of viruses associating with each other in the same host. Um, and so that this was found mainly in Europe uh, and North America and South America, but not in Oceania or, or Asia. Uh, and so this means that the virus clades, the all the strains are mixing. So you go to the Diwania, you get uh, a G type, uh, you go to the next Diwania uh, or, or cinema, you get a V type, and then, and, and then all of them are in one cell. And so imagine what happens if you have this and you have MERS with it as well. And so the virus is able to recombine with each other and change. Uh, and that's why we have to, uh, 
um, track the mutations. And, and this is what happened in the mink. So the virus with this mutation now was able to jump to the mink uh, in Denmark and Netherlands. And, and these mutations happen in the, well, everywhere, but mainly in the S protein that we worry about because they make the virus either more aggressive or less aggressive. Um, but also the vaccines might not work uh, if, if the virus changes um, or mutates in that sense. So we were worried about Kuwait because we have large families, we, have, we live in clusters, we, we marry cousins, uh, and we have 20% uh, of our population have type 2 diabetes, which is associated with high mortality from this virus. And we're number one ranked in obesity and blood pressure. So you name it, we have all the risk factors. So one was expecting very high mortality rates. And, and this is um, a picture I took from the avenues uh, on 24th of July from the social media. And, and you can see, um, I will discuss with you why, what's happening here. Um, we don't really find, um, of course, we are very, almost always very sorry people are dying, but we don't see the number of deaths we see in uh, America and Europe uh, and so on. And we ask the 10, $1 billion question, why are some people dying from it and others are asymptomatic? Who is more susceptible to death? So you can see um, these are old figures, but you can see Qatar and Kuwait, are, uh, Oman, are the number one really in the world in terms of infection per population. So we have now numbers at hundreds of thousands. Per population, this is very high ratio. The good news is the mortality rate is lower. So in Kuwait, Saudi, Qatar, even in India, compared to Italy, Brazil, and, and so on. And this is uh, really an app uh, I've made just to compare. Um, you can see Belgium has a mortality death rate of 1,278 per million. We have 197, and this is today. And, and, and the total death here is 848. You know, the total death in the similar population in Europe um, is much, much tenfold higher. Uh, we don't expect this. We expect much higher mortality. We expect, um, you know, maybe we're younger. Maybe a lot of us take ACE inhibitors. Maybe a lot of us take uh, lipid-lowering drugs. And, and we published these uh, articles um, warning people that maybe maybe this is but most importantly we think it's host genetics as well so for the virus to enter you i spoke about the virus itself it needs from the host uh, a receptor called ace2 which is an angiotensin converting enzyme 2 so the s protein would bind to it now tempress will cut ace2 and it also cut the virus so it it helps the virus to enter Furin is another gene and the protein that cuts the S protein uh, of, of, the, of the virus and allowing it to go in. So you can imagine uh, if you have a mutation here that increases the binding, you will have more viruses in and the patients more likely to have severe uh, infections. If you have maybe another mutation here or here that stops this protein from working, then it is possible that the virus will be blocked. Okay, so maybe, maybe, and this is the question, we have, our population has more mutations here or, or here, uh, and so on. It's a little bit uh, unintuitive, but uh, these are the hosts that we're talking about. And, and for that, we've uh, really sequenced, um, you know, a lot of people in Kuwait. And we also, um, of course, there is the Human Genome Project, which we also use. And what you find is very interesting, this mutation, the N720D in the ACE2 protein. Uh, it's about here, it's located at the collectorin, and this mutation seems to be extremely common in Europeans. And so this mutation actually helps the virus go in, while this mutation is quite rare in, in, in Qatar, uh, and Kuwait, moderate in there. And, and the beauty about this is we, we plotted that as the uh, minor allele frequency, how frequent is this mutation in the population and how frequent they die. And you can see a beautiful straight line 
um, indicating uh, a correlation between the two, but definitely not causation. And here we just put the countries as well to show the same thing. So the more mutation, this mutation particularly there is in the population, the more likely the virus will enter. Um, and we now know why, and we published this because, as you can see here, if the mutation in the ACE2 happens, um, this guy, the Tempress, can go in and cut the ACE2 much frequent, much easier. Um, we also looked at furan, and, and here's the opposite, of course. Now you find a higher population, 2.4% of the Kuwaiti population has this mutation. Is it possible that we have so many of this mutation that the virus is not affecting as many people uh, mortality as, as possible. So these are uh, indeed, and, and we, we were able to really publish this uh, very, um, you know, recently in there. And we have, um, this, is, this became the 5% of top all research published in, 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 this, um, in, in this journal. And of course, we, we filed a patent for this. Um, this grabbed attention a lot, and um, a, you know, Nature Middle East picked on it and, and talked about it, which is a good thing for us. But this, this is not enough. We had to really join the international community. You don't work alone in everything. In, you know, if there's one thing you learn from in, uh, today's talk is when you're doing research, don't do it alone because it's very likely you will fail do it with other people. So we joined the COVID human genetic uh, effort uh, really led by Jean-Laurent Casanova, uh, who's an amazing uh, scientist, and, and, and I and DDI are with them officially. But here's a very complicated slide that will tell you a very simple thing. Um, when you get an infection, um, virus, bacteria, whatever, but mainly viruses, you switch on your innate antiviral pathway. Uh, the first thing that increases your temperature, uh, that makes you shiver, that in this innate um, uh, pathway, um, this man is extremely experienced in because it's also a part of the diabetes uh, network that, uh, in fact, uh, will tell you, Dr. Rashid, uh, will tell you that uh, we have discovered part of this pathway at the DDI. And so the virus, when it enters, it activates the uh, type 1 interferons, which goes into the interferon receptors and activate the cellular defense. So the question of uh, in, this, in this cohort, could it be that people who are dying actually do not have this pathway functional? Remember, viruses actually try to stop this pathway from working. Um, viruses like Epstein-Barr, hepatitis, and all this. And, and so, indeed, uh, we found uh, that uh, people who are under life-threatening conditions, they have mutations in their genes um, that helps the virus to accumulate or kind of replicate quicker and much more. And this was pub published in, in science. But what's, um, so we looked at the mutations uh, in TLR as this pathway. I don't want to go in detail uh, in this, but if you have, if certain people have a mutation in this, their interferon will not work, uh, pathway will not work properly. So here, Kuwait, with the consortium, with the other data, we've discovered a new thing, uh, helping us understand who is more prone to, um, to have life-threatening COVID. And, and science has an impact factor of 42. So we published uh, really two papers in there. The second paper shows that if you're a patient with severe COVID, as in diabetes type one, you have autoantibody to GAD and to insulin or to whatever. Uh, in some patients, they have autoantibody towards interferon, okay? And that is very important finding because this means we can now check if a patient, before you get the, uh, the, the virus, uh, if you have autoantibody towards interferon, this means you really need to be isolated. Um, and now we've developed the test with the, and, and it's really open for everybody to join. So now we know at least in 3.5% of the people, uh, they have certain mutations. 
um, and they may they become more vulnerable to this uh, virus or develop autoantibodies. Of course, we're looking for other things as well with the consortium. But the message here is now we have uh, good tests to see who will go, will have severe, or will go to intensive care, and who will not. And therefore, if you want a strategy to open up the country, you have one. And that's phenomenal contribution um, by DDI scientists. Uh, now, we published these two in science, um, but I just wanted to point for fun that Charles M. Rice, who won, I think, the medicine um, a Nobel Prize, is a co-author with us. He's, a, he's in hepatitis, so that's a really nice, nice thing to have. It's good for the history. Um, this is what our administrators tell us every day. Um, during COVID crisis, we really have formidable opportunity to, to demonstrate that the Desman Diabetes Institute can be much more than a slogan. We can make it a, a research game changer for humanity. And this is exactly what we did. Um, you know, I, I, I really want to thank everybody. Uh, but I had to bring out some people because in my dictionary, these are giants. Uh, these are giants uh, of research, and um, I don't want to name, uh, name them personally. They're all uh, amazing people um, who helped us th from the MOH, MOH, Kuwait University, and DDI itself. But, but really, uh, we need to kind of support uh, these people much more, and I thank you for really uh, listening to me uh, today. Thank you, Dr. Almola, for that presentation. Uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say, you know, thank you for your swift response and for this incredible work and in continuously monitoring uh, the mutations in this virus. Um, we're going to keep all the questions until the very end of the presentation, or the very end of the session, and we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker for the evening is Dr. Ali Al Hamoud. Dr. Ali Al Hamoud is a research scientist in the Environment and Life Sciences Research Center at Kissin. He is a researcher that focuses in occupational and environmental health, public safety, safety, uh, ergonomics, and risk assessments. He will be presenting on his study titled Particle Size and Transport Potential of SARS CoV 2 in Indoor and Outdoor Environments. Uh, feel free to turn on your uh, your uh, video, uh, Dr. Al Hamoud, and, and prepare. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say that, of course, the transport of the disease in the environment is something we all spend quite a great deal of time worrying about. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Al Hamoud. Yes, hi, good evening. Thanks. It's my pleasure to be with you on this evening. And I would like to thank KFAS for giving us the opportunity to present our uh, project. Now, basically, the ongoing outbreak of COVID-19, which has spread rapidly throughout the world and sparked, sparked globally, it triggered our attention. Uh, while the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through human respiratory droplets and contact with infected person is clear through, from World Health Organization as well as the CDC, they have confirmed that SARS-CoV-2 uh, can transport through contacts with symptomatic patients, as well as through droplets, plus through aerosol generating procedures in the hospitals. However, the aerosol transmission, the aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2 has been little studied. Therefore, I will present my presentation. First, I will give the objective of the study then some uh, literature review, then I will talk about the method that we have conducted, and later on, I will uh, provide the results. Now, the objective basically is to, th to determine if SARS-CoV-2 particles are present indoor and outdoor air, and also to estimate the viral concentrations. What is the viral concentrations within the airborne size particles. In other words, we have uh, done 
three size fractions of particles. The first, we would like to determine if the virus is present in fine particles, in the very fine particles, which, are, which is below 2.5 microns, and they are called respiratable, respirable particles. And if the virus is present in coarse particles, or in other words, inhalable particles, between 2.5 and 10, and if the virus is present in large particles, which are more than 10 microns. Now, some literature review. Traditionally, the medical community relied heavily on the dichotomy of droplet, which is greater than 5 microns, or the airborne, which is less than 5 microns. This, is, this has been since January, February, March, and later on up to July. Uh, basically, they have, mentioned, they have said that the virus is, is carried uh, mostly on droplet, which is four, more than 5 microns. And very few research have said that not only uh, more than 5 microns, but also less than that, which is, which is uh, on airborne, less than 5 microns. Now, there are two studies, very important studies, which were done very, very early on in March and April. One was done by the National Center for Infection disease in Singapore, and they have suggested that the SARS-CoV-2 is, is present in particles between 1 to 4 microns and also more than 4 microns. And also, important thing they have mentioned that they said the shedding of the virus is mostly and high during the first week of infection. And after the first week, after 10 days, then viral shedding in the air is less. This is presented by Chia. Then another study, which was done in the field hospital in Wuhan, they have separated the aerosols into five ranges, more than 2.5, and then uh, one to 2.5, all the way to below, to, uh, below 0.25 microns. And they have said that the highest concentrations were observed in, in the patient mobile toilet, in the toilet room, as well as in the uh, protective apparel, for example, changing the rooms of the physicians, and this was by Liu in 2020. Few more studies, also they said that the small particles containing the SARS-CoV-2 can be transported in the indoor environment, and up to 10 microns. This study, of course, by very well pioneers in the virus, uh, study, uh, virus research, Morwaska and Kao. They have said that it can be transported in indoor air up to 10 meters. And another study, they say that the small droplets can be direct, which is directly emitted from sneezes from the people, uh, symptomatic patients can travel to a distance up to eight meters. And again, Morwaska, they have, she, she has said that inhaling, inhaling small particle droplets aerosols is probable as a fair root of infection. Fair root of infection, it means other than contacts and other than droplets, in addition to them. Now, our method, what we have done, basically, our study, alhamdulillah, this is the most comprehensive COVID-19 air sampling study, study which has been done worldwide in the healthcare workplace. What do we mean by the most comprehensive study which has been done worldwide? In other words, we collected simultaneously air samples, the highest number of air samples in the world so far. We have collected 210 air samples in healthcare settings. Of course, these 210 samples included 36 blanks and uh, in, three, in uh, three different size fractions. In 30 unique locations, the highest study has done 135 samples, but our study was 210 samples. And by the way, this study is still continuing. It's not finished yet. We still need to do in the open field. Now we have done the study in Jabber Hospital, as well as in the temporary quarantine. In Jabber Hospital, we have collected air samples in the ICU rooms, as well as in the patient rooms, in nursing station, changing rooms, bathrooms, reception, observation rooms, and outdoor, indoor and outdoor. In the temporary quarantine, which is located in front of Jabba Hospital, we have collected the samples in, uh, in the reception areas, in swap areas, 
as well as outdoor. Now, this is, this is the, basically the device which we have used. This device is, this device is the micro environmental cascade impactor. This cascade impactor was developed by Harvard University and they are with us as team members and as consultants, uh, Chan School of Public Health. Now, basically, the first, as you see, the first impactor collects the large size particles, which is particle PM10. When the airflow goes through the large size impactor, it, it at, uh, basically it uh, absorbs large size particles which are greater than PM10, and we call them large particles. Then it will go down further to the inhal inhalable particles, which are between 2.5 and 10. And later on, it will go to the third fine, which is the PM2.5, which is based, basically it's a glass fiber filter. To illustrate it further, the device looks like this. The first impactor stage uses polyurethane foam, puff, puff substrate to collect, to collect the large particles, which are more than PM10. Then the second impactor will collect smaller, it has a smaller puff substrate to collect particles which are in the coarse size range between PM2.5 and PM10. And the last stage fiber, it's a glass fiber and collects the very fine particles, which are respirable particles below 2.5 microns. Of course, the cascades were processed in biosafety level two, lab laboratory hood with HIPAA filter. And by the way, we took this uh, biosafety level two and we have put it in Jabber Hospital. And we'd like to thank the management for Jabber Hospital for allowing us to do this. Of course, full PPE, this is my picture, by the way, full PPE were used during aerosol sampling in both Jabber Hospital as well as the temporary quarantine. These are some images of the cascade impactor. One to the left is inside the ICU and to the right is it's inside the changing clothes rooms. These are the indoor. And also we have put outdoor sampling. The one to the left is in front of the gate in Jabber Hospital, and the one to the right, it is in front of this, the temporary quarantine. Now we have done RNA extraction and reverse transcript quantitative polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR tests. And the, the positive samples were identified those which are below a cycle of threshold of 39. Now I will present my results. These are the results. Now a key finding is that the size distribution of SARS-CoV-2 was dependent on the location where particles were collected. For example, the one on the left here, this is the ICU. And in the middle, this is the patient rooms, indoor, and then the one to the right, this is the outdoor. Now what we get from this, these are three size fractions. What we get from this, for example, samples collected in symptomatic patient rooms were associated with larger particles. And which may be, which may be because patients were not required to wear their masks at all times in the rooms. In other words, pa symptomatic patients that were in, whether it is for patient room or a single patient room were not, were not required to wear the masks. Plus, systematic, uh, symptomatic patients were also more likely to cough and sneeze. And these behaviors will generate larger particles. Now, sympt symptomatic patients also generate larger particles other than 
asymptomatic patients. For example, in our study, we have identified negative results with, from asymptomatic patients. <clears throat> now, and this conclusion, actually, by the way, it is in agreement with Shia, who reported that the concentration of the virus in air samples at hospital settings are highest in the first week. We, had, we identified that the higher viral shedding was in the first week. Positive samples in the ICU were not in large size fractions, perhaps, perhaps because these patients were, were intubated and they are unable to shed large particles through actions, for example, like sneezing and coughing, like the symptomatic patients that were in the rooms. It was unexpected to find a similar ratio of positive samples in the in outdoor. Unexpected. Positive samples from the outdoor locations were in the fine and coarse size fractions. Possibly emission sources at the outside location may be located farther away, farther from the sampler, thus producing particles which are smaller in size. And also because of the evaporation of droplets outdoor, because of maybe it's a hot temperature, so evaporation of droplets, and therefore became in, a, in the fine size fractions. Now this is also similar. Here's basically what we show. What we show here that the ICU, the ICU, we had fine particles as well as coarse particles. Of course, the ICU, which are the positive pressure, and this is very important finding actually, that negative pressure ICU in Jabal Hospital, they were negative SARS-CoV-2. Only the neutral pressure, we had positive, positive samples. Uh, symptomatic patient rooms, also they were in the course and the large particles and negative, negative SARS-CoV-2 uh, was in the nursing station, the men's locker room, patient room, bathrooms, hospital, and it was positive also in the outdoor. Now, my last two slides, I will give the conclusion Basically, what are, our, what are our conclusions? SARS COVID 2 was present in all three particle size fractions, and the size fraction dependent on the location where the sample was carried out, whether it is in the ICU, whether it is in the patient rooms, and whether it is outdoor. Positive samples from symptomatic patient rooms were in the coarse and large size fractions. And we said, why it is in the coarse and large size? We expect this were coughing and sneezing, sneezing, so they are giving droplets, which are high, high particle size. On the contrary, all samples collected in the asymptomatic patient rooms were negative. Positive samples from the ICU and the outside, and the out, outdoor the gate, they were in the fine size fractions. And the concentration the concentration, the outside locations were relatively low compared to those in the symptomatic patient room in the ICU. In other words, the outdoor, although we found positive SARS-CoV-2 outdoor outside the gate, but they were in much smaller, they were in much smaller size concentration than the ICUs. And all samples, by the way, this is also an important finding, all samples which were collected from the temporary quarantine in South Surrey were negative. 99 samples were negative. Only 13 positives were in Jabber Hospital. Now, what are the practical implications? The practical implications, this is my last slide, what we get from this research, SARS-CoV-2 is detectable in the air in hospital settings. Now, airborne precautions seem to be a convincing strategy to protect healthcare workers from the risk of COVID-19. Not only contacts and droplets, but as well as we need to be careful, we have to put extra control measures for airborne precautions. Particle aerodynamic size fraction depends on certain conditions. What are these certain conditions? Somebody asked me before. What are the conditions which we can say that SARS-CoV-2 is positive? First, symptomatic patients. Second, people not wearing face masks. Third, when there is crowd and, and congestion, when there is traffic. These are the three conditions. 
And the last point, that the rigorous disinfection implemented in the observation rooms and the hallway and the hallways in Jabir Hospital were effective in controlling. In other words, in Jabir Hospital and also in the temporary quarantine, they were doing uh, rigorous uh, disinfection and sterilization of the, the halls and the rooms and so on. So this was an effective approach to reduce and control airborne SARS-CoV-2. Thank you for listening. Presentation and for uh, your you know great work on what is a an important interdisciplinary um, sorry in, in, uh, international collaborative project. Um, I certainly think about this all the time about the transport and the contamination that that we all worry about when it comes to this virus. Um, moving on now to our third speaker, um, we are happy to introduce uh, Dr. Dalal Al Sarid, who is an early career researcher. Uh, she is a clinical operations manager in the medical division of the Jasmine Diabetes Institute and is on full-time second mid from the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Saeed received her PhD from University College London School of Pharmacy on the topic of optimizing medications for individuals with dementia and their caregivers. This presentation, uh, titled Inside the Minds of COVID-19 Healthcare Teams in Kuwait, sheds important light on the mental health impact of the coronavirus on the country's frontline workers, which of course is an essential uh, essential thing that they face that many people in this country are facing and around the world are facing during this pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Ali Hamoud. I'm now going to be introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dalal Al Saeed. Thank you for uh, being part of this. Uh, Dr. Dalal Al Saeed is an early career researcher uh, and a clinical operations manager in the medical division of the Desmond Diabetes Institute and is on full time second from the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Al Saeed received her PhD from the University College London School of Pharmacy on the topic of optimizing medication use for individuals with dementia and their caregivers. This presentation is titled Inside the Minds of COVID-19 Healthcare Teams in Kuwait, and it sheds light on the important mental health impact of the coronavirus uh, on frontline workers, which of course mental health is something that everyone in the world is currently facing during this pandemic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Al Saeed, and welcome. Thank you, Tamara, for that introduction. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Dalal. Um, I'm the Clinical Operations Manager at Desman Diabetes Institute. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss an important aspect concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a complete shift from what my colleagues are presenting on, which is the psychological impact on healthcare teams in Kuwait. So this started with um, my co-PI, Dr. Abdullah Lazeri. He started a telehealth psychiatry service, uh, which started in Lempi Hospital in, early, in March. And this was to help struggling healthcare professionals. And through our conversations with each other and based on his interactions with healthcare professionals, we decided to shed light on this issue, and which is why we're here today, to discuss why it's important and how we're able to address it. So just a brief background about the, the pandemic, which, as we all know, uh, started at the end of 2019 with the emergence and the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which has reached pandemic proportions. And according to the WHO, as of the 16th of November, there have been over 54 million confirmed cases, uh, as well as more than a million deaths. And the situation around the world has been unstable. We've seen countries go into their second and their third wave, while others are in the recovery phase. So we've seen these changes because uh, about uh, it depends on how each country was dealing with the with the pandemic with the pandemic and the spread and the measures that they put in place. So in response to COVID-19, uh, we've seen countries around the world have, uh, they've put in place a range of public health and social measures to try and suppress the spread of the virus. So we've seen things like curfews, partial or full lockdowns, social distancing, uh, enforcing uh, people to wear masks, 
uh, we had a time when everyone was working from home, home and we had to shift to remote working, as well as some uh, schools around the world closing and shifting towards virtual learning. And unfortunately, there has been some inconsistency worldwide in the uptake of these measures, which is, of course, reflected in the number of cases that we see. For example, the UK now, they've gone into their second lockdown to try to uh, reduce the number of cases and deaths. So looking at Kuwait, um, we know at the beginning uh, all of the cases were imported cases, but this has shifted towards local transmission. And as such, to help tackle this, the government then implemented a five-phase plan uh, with partial and full lockdown, um, people working from home, and all schools closing and uh, universities and shifting to virtual learning. And we started moving from uh, phase to phase, uh, depending on the number of cases that we had. Um, and as of November 16th, we've had, as you can see, more than 137,000 confirmed cases in the country, a total cases, and uh, more than 840 deaths. So shifting towards how this has a psychological impact, which was significant worldwide. So a recent review and meta-analysis synthesized the existing literature, which is around 50 studies at the time of publication in August, to find out the prevalence of psychological morbidities during COVID-19. And as you can see, there were very high numbers, uh, including poor sleep quality, um, psychological distress, insomnia, anxiety, depression and uh, we can see that it had a major impact on people's mental health whether they were patients healthcare professionals or members of the public so if we move towards how this had an impact on healthcare professionals whether it's in kuwait or worldwide healthcare professionals are overworked to meet the demands of the increase in number of cases and uh, this has put them on a put on them a great psychological pressure, which has drained them both physically and emotionally. And there was even a time here in Kuwait where the Ministry of Health had to call onto people working in the private sector to help meet the demand in cases. Furthermore, we had a time when there was shortage in personal protective equipment or PPE and of testing and lack of support within the health, uh, the ministry, uh, within hospitals and uh, the environment. Based on our interactions, we saw healthcare professionals displaying symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, stating they have nightmares about going back to work or nightmares about infecting family members. We have heard of people who haven't seen their family for months on end, eight months since the pandemic started in Kuwait. Um, and some unfortunately lost family members due to COVID and they were unable to see them. So you can imagine the toll that takes on somebody. Uh, and we know that the media played a pivotal role. We saw important local figures disparaging the efforts of the Ministry of Health and by association, the healthcare professionals involved. So for example, we, we, they were spreading uh, reports on incidents happening at hospitals or quarantine centers while the healthcare professionals were striving or fighting to save lives. There was a lot of fear mongering and misinformation that was rapidly spread through social media, through WhatsApp, and this then led to increase in anxiety. There was also some social stigma that healthcare professionals were experiencing, where they felt they were shunned by friends, by family, because they were working in COVID teams. So you can imagine how that would feel to someone uh, where they are on the front lines trying to save lives. And then, so this all then results into all these psychological morbidities, like depression, anxiety, stress, uh, isolation, and ultimately burnout and the inability to work. So to be able to get an in-depth uh, understanding of healthcare professionals' uh, experiences, qualitative methods are needed. So at the time of submitting our uh, proposal, um, there were no qualitative studies published worldwide and our idea was novel. But since then, and to our knowledge, there have been four publications, two in China, one in Pakistan, and one from Turkey. Um, and they interviewed nurses, physicians, and emergency healthcare workers. 
they all had a similar aim of exploring, experiencing experiences and determining psychological impact of COVID-19 and the ensuing psychosocial uh, issues. So we've synthesized the data and on four themes as seen in the diagram. The psychosocial issues included participants um, reporting feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, experiencing social stigma and isolation and uh, paranoia and wanting to quit their jobs. Their working conditions were very intense. Um, so we had people who were working in a completely new context, uh, working for long hours in never ending shifts and not having the ability to take time off to take care of themselves. Um, and this, of course, then impacted patient care negatively. And to be able to deal with all of this, healthcare professionals had them to um, come up with their own coping strategies or coping mechanisms. And this included trying to normalize what they're going through or refusing to dwell on their experiences and trying to find distractions like uh, doing physical activity and trying to limit their exposure to media. Um, and of course, this showed that there was a lack of support, be it psychosocial support or even resource management, such as uh, availability of adequate PPE and, uh, and working and improving working conditions. So based on our interactions with healthcare professionals, we, we saw that they felt like they were going to war. They had a warlike mentality. And as soldiers, they felt that they were not properly trained or built to deal with this pandemic. And thus any coping strat strategies that they came up with felt inadequate. So it's because our healthcare systems at the moment are all about chronic diseases and their treatments and not about anything on this mass level. So why is this important? Well, we know that healthcare providers are a vital resource for any country. Their health and safety is not only crucial for continuous and safe patient care, but also for the control of any outbreak and similarly what we're going through now. They also play a, a major role in reducing the psychological stress in patients. So as we've seen in the previous slide, we know that healthcare professionals coped uh, in different ways and some of them would go on uh, autopilot to deal with this pandemic. Uh, they had a lot of fear and uncertainty and this led to paranoia and irrational behaviors, which may lead to medical errors merely to negatively affecting the quality of care they provide to patients, as well as a reduction in staff retention rates due to burnout. So it's really important that we support our medical staff and psychological support is an essential part of that. So with our aim, we hope to understand the psychological impact from the Kuwaiti perspective on our COVID-19 healthcare teams. By understanding that, we would, we would be able to develop and implement targeted support to alleviate their stress and enhance their well-being and resilience. So in order to achieve this, we'll be uh, using qualitative approach, using semi-structured uh, interviews, and to be able to fulfill our objectives, we'll have purpose of sampling to choose uh, healthcare professionals who are part of the COVID-19 teams, who are dealing with patients who are COVID uh, positive. Um, we will recruit using the telehealth psychiatry service that I talked about in the beginning, which although was small and started in a needy hospital, I'm very happy to say that it's now across all of the Ministry of Health. And it's called We Are Here. And um, anyone in hospitals can see a QR code uh, and go and um, take a picture takes them to a form to fill in, goes to a, a, a person from the psychiatrist or psychologist to be able to call them uh, and to have a session with them. So in terms of our sample size, we're hoping for uh, 15 to 20. This is based on the existing literature uh, or until we reach that saturation, which is the point where no new information or no new themes emerge. And we've developed a semi-structured topic guide and this was informed uh, from the previous existing literature, as well as discussions with healthcare professionals and the research team. So as with the, with the circumstances at the moment, as we may not be able to conveniently perform face-to-face -face interviews, 
uh, with participants. We decided to do them over video calls in the Zoom for Healthcare app. Uh, we anticipate interviews to be between 30 to 90 minutes, and this depends, of course, on the participants themselves. All the interviews are recorded and transcribed verbatim. Um, and in terms of analysis, we'll be using thematic framework analysis, which is an iterative process. Um, and each interview will help inform the data collection process. We'll be also using constant comparison across the transcripts. And for data management, we'll be using the software uh, Max QDA, which will enable us, uh, enable us to be uh, easier and an accurate search of codes and themes across the data sets. So uh, in terms of the thematic framework analysis, this is just to briefly outline or give an overview of the analysis method. It consists of three stages, which is the data management stage, um, following, uh, followed on by descriptive accounts and explanatory accounts. And these are all done in a, in a continuum, so one can feed into the other. So in terms of our anticipated research outcomes, we hope to ultimately support our healthcare teams. Uh, we don't know how the landscape is going to look like in the next month, two months, a year's time. With the new vaccines coming out or any new treatments, we don't know what's going to happen really. And as such, it's really imperative that we develop and implement supportive interventions across the Ministry of Health for our healthcare professionals to ensure they are inherently resilient to deal with any future outbreaks. And we are hoping our results would inform other studies looking at developing uh, future services. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. I would also like to thank my co-PI, Dr. Abdel Lazeri, and I would like to thank KFIS for this opportunity and for um, encouraging young Kuwaiti researchers and scientists to help tackle the COVID-19 crisis in Kuwait. Thank you. The important topic, um, one that many people are now starting to uh, acknowledge more, more widely. For our last, uh, but not for our last uh, speaker this evening, I would like to present uh, Professor uh, Hanvir Gasana. I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly, Doctor, um, who is an associate professor and founding chair for the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Kuwait University. He is also a member of the Editorial Advisory Board for the National Safety Council in the USA. Tonight, he will be presenting on his study titled Strengthening Capacity for the Protection of Occupational Health and the Safety of Healthcare Workers and non health during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Uh, this study is also in collaboration with the Harvard, Harvard University and the uh, WHO. Uh, Dr. Gassana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tamara. First of all, I thank uh, KFAS for giving us an opportunity to present our work. And uh, thank you for uh, those who are uh, in attendance because uh, we'd like to share uh, what we did in our um, study. Uh, before I, I get to tell you what the project entails, I need to acknowledge my collaborators, which uh, includes uh, our Dean of uh, Faculty of Public Health, Dr. Harry Venio, my colleague Mustafa Al-Zamur, we have Dr. Barak, uh, you know, Ahmad, who's uh, our scholar in mission at Harvard University. Then we have Dr. Fubhendu from, uh, he's a conservative WHO and ILO. And then you have uh, uh, staff from uh, the Minister of, uh, of Health, the Department of Occupational Health uh, in uh, at the MOH. Our study was, a, it's a six month project. The first part was actually started in, in July and uh, it, this was actually in, in taken care of by our uh, graduate students, and I should, uh, I should have mentioned them also. There are about 12 of them, and uh, half of them just graduated, they got their master's of public health. 
they did really a wonderful job because um, they went on uh, you know, to basically recruit the participants. In each of the six health districts in Kuwait, so the aim was uh, to target that to actually to get at least 20 in each. So overall, we we're expecting 120 uh, participants. But we ended up getting more, it was close to 200, because uh, what we did, uh, not only we did uh, uh, interview, we, we look recruiting uh, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, but also the supervisors of uh, uh, migrant workers, because uh, they work in uh, hotels and uh, in different banks and uh, grocery stores, and because we feel those are affected. You will see a paper you publish out of, out, out of this uh, study. At the end, I'll show you the results. And then after the survey, we decide to, to have uh, an, uh, you know, a training. Because as I said, the title said, it's a strengthening the protection of uh, occupational health, health workers. Because there are some type of uh, occupational health and safety, you know, in the teams, or committees, and the different branch of the Minister of Health. What we're trying to do is to strengthen them. That's why we use these programs from WHO, was created a number of years ago. It actually, it was a collaboration between WHO and ILO, which is called HealthWise. It's looking at the occupational health and safety of health workers. When we talk about health workers, it's not just the doctors and nurses. We talk about the cleaners. We talk about the porters. We talk about the visitors. You know, everybody who is in a healthcare setting. But also, we added the non-healthcare facilities like hotels, like uh, you know, banks, because they will, you know, somehow get get exposed to those, uh, you know, to the to the virus. The first objective that was uh, to look at the current situation. In healthcare and non-healthcare facilities in Kuwait, you will see at the end we have uh, results of two surveys we conducted, and uh, the next slide actually it shows you what you already know. Uh, the goal is to slow the transmission because that that's what WHO tells us: reduce associated mortality mainly, maintain a steady low level and or no transmission, and then use public health and social controls measures. Do you know them? You know, by now, by now everybody knows this because uh, it been, they've been a song, personal protective equipment, environmental measures, physical distancing, travel-related measures. The beauty of the public health, you don't have to wait until you get all the scientific evidence. Because some of you remember, we started really preventing the, you know, HIV AIDS before we even knew everything about the virus. But that's uh, you don't wait until you hear the last, the, 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 I mean, the last evidence about, about the virus. This is what we had. Uh, this is actually when we're collecting the data on the current situation in Kuwait. You, you can see looking at this uh, graph, uh, non Kuwaiti cases are much higher, and then you see the different uh, stages of. Uh, uh, you know, lockdown and uh, some of the previous, uh, uh, you know, presenters have mentioned this, and, you know, but you see, the non quality cases are higher because, uh, as you will see in one, uh, you know, the paper we published at the end about migrant workers, you know, first of all, that many, that, I mean, uh, two thirds of the population of Kuwait, you know, Kuwait being one third, so any, anybody understand? But then the condition they live in, and that's really, because we've been told some stories, in fact, some can live in, to, in, in two, two bedroom apartment, and, uh, I mean, a number of 12, 10 or 12. That's unacceptable in this type of uh, pandemic because there is no way you can, you, you can be able to wash your hands and you know, have social distancing and if you're 12 and, and two bedroom apartment. So that's why, the, you know, so we had our case from um, the beginning, from uh, February to, to May. And then we, of course, this was a response strategy of Kuwait. They're using WHO, I mean, uh, suggestions. 
which level one, level two, and level three. Level one it covers state of transmission. Level two includes, you know, or uh, proceed. I mean, this least specific to a country. Level three, you add, you know, basically additional public health and social measures that include lockdown and uh, and, and curfew. And then he planned to gradual recovery. You know, you're trying to, to go to normal because what happens so when you have this type of virus and you know, the economy is affected because people are working or being uh, some, most of the people who are working from home. And then you got really to keep really sending the message, telling them, look, you need to follow the public health and social, social control measures. And uh, that's something you need to keep repeating. So phase one was about the mask and the places of worship and industrial activities. And, you know, most of you know, know this, and, you know, telecom and internet service provider, food retailers and gas station and social services. And, and then of course, hospitals and the clinic. And then phase two, then we, we this workplaces. Construction, building, finance, financial, uh, banking, uh, you know, workplaces, shopping malls. Uh, phase three is workplace, but with less than 50%. The previous one, the phase two, was less than 30%. The social uh, care uh, fac uh, facilities for visitors, hotels, resort, that's why we include the non healthcare workers. This is a summary of all those different phases. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, phase four includes phase one, two, and three, but then it includes public transportation, distancing, sewing shops, and tele workshops, and, and then you have workplaces, you know, with uh, more than uh, increased by then 50%, and you have restaurants and, and a cafe with distancing, personal care shops. This is saloons, spa, hairdressers. So you got it to, you know, that's a phase four. This is some of all the phases. Pretty much you all know this, but uh, the guidelines for opening the airport uh, terminals, and, you know, this is really worldwide or the most countries, I mean, all countries do, you know, health monitor, visitors and workers, both and uh, staff and safety provisions. And you know, you have to make sure they manage the suspected cases. As soon they come in, because when you do find cases, you have to quarantine them, and then different measures being taken. In fact, I have two, three colleagues who left for a uh, uh, break, and what they did, they had to be tested before they left the airport. And then uh, when they got to the respective country, they had to be quarantined for 14 days. When they're coming back in two weeks, in, in a week actually, they'll be quarantined 14 days also in Kuwait. You see all the measures taken by uh, uh, the countries to be able to, to deal with this. So there are specific guidelines for uh, occupation and safety provision for different sections, a covered dispatcher, arrival. You know, if you if you happen to travel, you, you've seen what really people have to go through when they're trying to, to get out. So the, the current COVID-19 status, actually Dr. Dalar mentioned those cases, you know, but uh, what I really, really want to share with you is the surveys that, you know, that we conduct among healthcare workers and then healthcare workers from industries and services. Uh, so part one, as I said, was from July to September. We did a survey and we, 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 we shared the, the results of the survey with the stakeholders because uh, as soon as the KFAS approved our uh, you know report you know uh, our report we uh, send it to minister of health in fact we send a copy to minister of health because they want to uh, report and then we'll be sending them to different uh, health district so the survey actually was conducted among 150 uh, 15 workers from uh, healthcare workers and 53 uh, from non-healthcare workers the purpose was to identify the risk associated with workplace and then Design preventive measures. How do you prevent this? As I said, you don't need to have everything before you. So we found out among the healthcare facility responded, almost 55% reported 
a history of the having a contact within a one major, as you know, that's not allowed in this case, over confirming the COVID case in healthcare facilities. So more than one third are having export to aerosol generating procedures. These are open air suctioning, 66%, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, 7.83%. Now, more, more than a quarter you know, have involvement with uh, uh, other facilities out of their workplace. This can add the risk to, of infection for such workers. The contamination, to me, to be done, uh, so far the contamination happened to be done in two thirds. So one third doesn't really get the, the regular decontamination, which is a problem. During the use of aerosol generating procedures on a COVID-19 cases, Two-third report having A95, which is the, the mask that a healthcare professional had to wear, or equivalent of respiratory So one third don't have that. This sort of incident of splash biological fluid respiratory uh, secretions in the eye that happened to be 5.22 percent uh, cases. That's not high, but still, they, that's five percent should be exposed. So the recommendation is uh, better compliance with preventive measures such as uh, disinfection. You remember the Dr. Ali he talked about uh, the different places we took the samples. One of the rooms where you know, you know he, he looked at that when they removed the clothes, and you have to make sure the, all those areas are decontaminated on a regular basis. Use of respirators. Availability of a protective gear uh, should be paramount important for the uh, for the Minister of Health. And this was a really a major problem. Uh, I know Dr. Armura, Professor Armura mentioned in the United States, I happen to be <laughs> from the US. And, and uh, this, this is the worst cases if you really try to study how to prevent um, you know, the spread of uh, COVID 19. They just did the opposite of what anybody should do. And uh, one of the major issues they had was they didn't have a protective against most of these uh, health networks in the beginning. So the use of aerosol generating procedures, they had to make sure that everybody had that, because remember two thirds, you know, they, 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 they had that. And then you prevent, you try to reduce uh, the contact of people from outside the workplace because when they have a contact outside of a place, that increase the risk. And then in only health care workers facilities responded. About 40% use public transportation. You can see that a really, a re, that can really lead to a high risk in, in terms of uh, uh, acquiring this virus. And two thirds report interaction with clients and customers you know, throughout their shift in workplaces. And one third they has prolonged the close interaction. But luckily, almost 93% report having some type of personal protective equipment. That, that, that's good. And then you have um, more than one quarter uh, reported that uh, they were really not being able to keep the recommended uh, measure, the distance possible between. So the, the social distancing was not possible. Now, 55% report to, to move out of the workplace, external to areas of the work related issues, or keeping desire was maybe not possible. Like those who live, you know, if you had 12 or 10 in a, in a two bedroom apartment, you understand that that's really not possible at all. So, less than 50%, they, they only receive training in a workplace, and only 41.51% receive training in a preferred language. Because, you know, when you talk about migrant workers, most of these, you know, they, don't speak good English, they don't speak good Arabic. And when uh, you don't have really somebody to translate a new language, that becomes a problem. The recommendations are the public transportation, you know, should be a vector, you know, a key vector for uh, COVID, uh, it is, you know, for transmission because you're in a public, you know, areas and operator of public transport should be involved the stakeholders in community transmission. Training is important, and uh, how to practice uh, social distancing. Uh, provision of uh, pro, uh, PPEs is very important. Engineering controls to reduce uh, 
exposed you. You remember that Adam talked about in, in, in a room in a job, you know, the, the bear hospital where, uh, you know, you have negative, uh, you know, pressure and they have less case in the, in the area. So you understand the engineering controls can work. So uh, language specific training on preventive measures are necessarily needed. This is our paper we published that you, know, that you see the Barak al Hamad, the first author. These are stressors of migrant workers in Kuwait. And then we use a risk assessment uh, uh, you know, paradigm basically to, to do this. You know, migrant workers are marginalized by subpopulation in many countries, including Kuwait. It's not just Kuwait. And often short, uh, fall short of protection by public policies. For example, the idea of having 10 people in a two bedroom apartment. If you're in America, that's not allowed because the building codes don't allow to have more than two people or three in a, in a two-bedroom apartment. So if you have a, a building code enforced, you've got to enforce them, then you have less likelihood of a spread of this virus. So, you know, so the, the migrant codes happen to lead it to to be affected by the public policies, face language and cultural barriers, and take precarious jobs with more hazards, less pay and long hours. And uh, uh, this place uh, multiple extraordinary stress in the migrant workers. But the main four areas where uh, migrant workers get affected is in the workplace, in the environment, community, individual domain. You, know, you, you understand, somebody who left their country they have pressure to send money to their country, and they were here, and then when you have a lockdown, you don't have a job, that really brings additional stress to what they were in the head. So we were able to use this tool to understand how uh, this can be prevented. So this is the, it takes money, takes people, and time, but a coordinated effort and the key social support would have substantial health benefit. Because as you saw the cases of uh, migrant workers, uh, when you see the non kuwaiti COVID to Kuwaiti, that figure itself tells you that you got to take care of those migrant workers. Otherwise, the case will keep increasing because uh, because you know you you have the source of uh, of, of spread basically. So this is our uh, training, this is the part two, October to December. Right now, we as I told you know we. It, the number varies, but uh, we we have uh, above 100 people attend every every week. We have uh, uh, seven modules for eight weeks because one of the modules really is a, 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 I mean is covering two weeks. So we we use the health uh, you know the, the health wise program from WHO and has been very very helpful. In fact, we'll be sharing the results of. Uh, of our training as soon as we, we, we finish it. You know, we're now in the fifth uh, week of uh, that training. We have two more, I mean, actually six. I mean, we had two more sessions and, and then we should be done. As I said, we have doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists. We have a supervisor of migrant workers. We have a supervisor, I mean, uh, banks and uh, hospitality industries, hotels. And, you know, grocery stores, because they all face similar problems in terms of, uh, you know, spread of uh, the, the, the virus. And uh, as we're finishing up, we we're about to finish this uh, training with the WHO, and, uh, ILO, the International Labor Organization, they came up with uh, a joint policy, and it's called Caring for Those Who Care, National Programs of Occupational Health, of Health Workers. As soon as I received this, I went to the Minister of Health. I met with the new Director of uh, Occupational Health, and we talked about how do we really make sure the Minister of Health in Kuwait adopt this policy? Because the last thing you really can afford is to lose your healthcare workers. You, you've seen what happens in many countries, including my own US, and we, you know, actually, overall, you know, 14% of, of death a, a, a cause due to COVID-19 happened you know, in healthcare workers, 14% of the death. 
that's that's a large number. You know, you don't this you don't want to see to have this happening. You know, and then you have the the content. It's a small um, policy, you know, booklet actually on thirteen pages. But basically, we're trying to do we're trying to take the Minister of Health and we had to work with the Minister of Labor and Social Affairs to try to find a strategy. As I said, each each hospital in Kuwait, each public health, you know, primary health care clinic, they have some type of health and safety committee, but they have to be strengthened. And the, the way it's being done, it has to be done, it's from the top down. If they have the support of the Minister of Health, and they can have somebody at the top who really coordinating all the different, you know, health and safety committees, from um, hospitals and from uh, different clinics, that's what WHO is really and, and I was advocating. Having this national program, they are really trying to have every single country adopt this. And I think this is really the time to to champion for this because uh, we learn so much about you know you know we just heard the, from my previous the previous presenter you know the stress that these healthcare workers go through. You understand, if it, even if they don't die, they're under tremendous stress. They don't really perform well because they're really afraid of uh, catching the virus to take, I mean, taking the virus to their families. It's, it's so many at, at stake. So, so many things at stake. That's why we need, we need to make sure we preserve them. In fact, in our training, we had um, this uh, young um, psychiatrist from South Africa. She talked about um, what they, she called, uh, she, she, she calls um, careful care. I mean, self-care, I'm sorry. Self-care, you take care of yourself first before you can take care of anybody. Because if you're a doctor, if you don't practice a self-care, you're not in good shape to help anybody, any of your patients. That's why really it's important to, to, to have a, a decent, you know, self-care to, to be able to, to function, to, to, help your, to, to help your patient. So, during our training, you know, we've been receiving some uh, comments, and one of the comments actually was uh, from a number of doctors. Said, oh, what if we expand this program to each of the hospitals and each of uh, uh, primary health care clinics? Because we, we have representatives from each of these. These are, we did what they call like a trainer trainers. So these we take up all the material we have, and then you can train your own colleagues in your own hospital and own clinic. That's really the idea because you got to spread this awareness because it's just a matter of knowing what to do. Because in the beginning, and, uh, we, we set up um, actual training was set in uh, Microsoft Teams and Moodle. And you can see the testimony of doctors and nurses and pharmacists that, you know, during the, this COVID pandemic. You know, I talked about the fact in the beginning, some people didn't really, you know, buy into this idea of wearing a mask and some end up getting infected and then uh, when they get infected they have a quarantine they have a shortage of stuff that brings all kinds of issues i mean basically if you see the scenarios in the united states and actually including my home state of florida where the governor let people go to the beach and go to bars and you know it's just a nightmare now they, they, are, they are paying the price of not really Listening to scientists, Professor Almura suggested in the beginning, said, please listen to scientists, because if you don't, you have to, to care the consequences and live with them. That's really a problem. So there is another aspect actually suggested by a number of doctors is, why don't we create a Kuwait university, a faculty of public health, a diploma in occupational health and safety for doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and then safety engineers. This will be a 21 credit hour. You can come and take. This will be in the evenings and weekends because you know you are busy. But now we allow to 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 really teach online. We can conduct all this online. So they suggest we do this, and I, I'm about to take it to the dean of uh, College of Graduate Studies because this is something we talked about in the past. At that time, we were not talking about online because it was not really, it was forbidden basically by law in Kuwait. But now. You know, at the time we talk about weekends and uh, evenings and, and for uh, doctors, nurses, and uh, safety engineers. But now we can do this using this, uh, you know, this uh, basically the, you know, the tools. So 
I, I, I'm finishing up my you know, presentation with three, you know, remember the three w, the W's. Wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands. And I think the next one will be, yes. And avoid the three C's. Crowded places, close contact settings, confine and close spaces. Remember the study by Dr. Ali. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you Dr. Asana. Thank you for that. Thank you, um, thank you everyone. Uh, that was our final speaker for uh, this session. I want to thank all of our speakers for participating. And we're going to very briefly uh, have our Q&A portion. Uh, we only really have time right now for perhaps one question. Uh, so it will be the one that we were asked here. Um, let's see. Uh, I believe this one is targeted to Dr. Uh, Professor Fahad Al Mullah. So if Professor Fahad Al Mullah could please uh, join us. Uh, the question is, are there any collaborations between you, which I assume is referring to DDI, and pharma in developing a vaccine? Uh, just generally, what is the state, do you think, of the vaccine uh, and the possibility for getting one? Um, no, no collaboration whatsoever to develop a vaccine. There's always collaboration to develop, uh, to work with the pharma. Um, this, is, this is what I'm advising, uh, basically. Um, um, if these giants I showed the slide for, um, if I will bet if they were given a task altogether uh, and were told we need to develop a vaccine and this is your budget, I'm going to bet that these giants will do it. Uh, that's, that's the truth because, you know, uh, we've worked on mRNA a lot uh, and remember it took two Turkish couple in Germany to make the Pfizer uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, Moderna is a genetic uh, company that is unknown before. No one knows Moderna, uh, but I know it a uh, few years ago because uh, it uses the mRNA to treat genetic diseases. So that the mRNA goes into the cell, the needle has electroporation capability, so you get an electric zap with it. So the RNA goes into the presenting cells or any cell, and then it expresses the viral S protein. But for genetic reason, for genetic diseases, we put the, R the mRNA in there. So it's not rocket science, okay? Uh, if someone uh, with funding uh, possibly uh, stop doing uh, one grant for one person and put a grant for a project, for a national project, like we would like to develop a vaccine. Now remember, this is, this is SARS-CoV-2, uh, MERS before. Uh, I am going to also make a bet that we, there will be another uh, virus, probably mo much more uh, um, horrible than this one, and we're going to go with the same cycle again. Uh, as a Kuwait, uh, uh, you know, for Kuwait, we need, uh, we really need to develop capacity within ourselves. Remember, remember this, the vaccine is going to go first to the people who developed it. They're not going to give it to you. There are 20 million doses. They're ramping it up to 60 million doses. You're not going to be the first to get it. Uh, Africa will not be the first to get it. Uh, so I am encouraging as a scientist to develop inner capacity. We have the, I'm, I'm telling you, I give lectures at the university, my, uh, not only at Kuwait University, but at West Virginia, our students surpasses anybody. Um, we've got really, really smart people here. Uh, and we need to, uh, uh, try a different strategy rather than give to every scientist doing their own thing. We need to start working together. And so at the moment, why would the pharma Pfizer's contact me or Dr. Muhammad Abu Farha or Dr. Salman Al Sabah? Why would they contact them? Why would they contact us? They have, you know, they have all the facilities to do that. Uh, and so 
um, we need to build it from ourselves. And, and this is this is my message to the policymakers. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our speakers uh, for your painstaking efforts uh, for attending this, this session, for speaking in it, and for the amount of work that you have all put in during this pandemic. And thank you to our attendees for being here on a Wednesday evening when I'm sure there were other things that were capturing your attention, too. <laughs> uh, I think I speak for all of us at KFAS when I say I hope you found it as enlightening as I did. And a reminder that a recorded version of this uh, session will be made available to you. Uh, and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Have a good night, everybody.